might one person's I want to kiss you with tongue gesture be read as you're like a sibling to me by the other. Content warning. The following video mentions abuse and torture. Hello fellow fic writers. Kudos for clicking on this video. My name is Cora and I'm here to help you write and post your dream fanfiction. So, according to the YouTube research tab, you all seem quite interested in ship dynamics. And since the last video I did to target a particular search term did so well, I thought, let's try that again. In this video, I'll be exploring six popular ship dynamics. Why they're appealing, what are their pitfalls, and how to write them well. But before we can get into that, it's time for the Sunday Bar Notice. Just like we all enjoy different toppings on our Sundays, we all enjoy our favorite ship dynamics in different ways. This video, more than any other, is based on my own subjective opinion and experiences. You are welcome and encouraged to ignore any advice that clashes with your own personal tastes or creative vision. Sometimes learning why someone does or doesn't like your favourite ship dynamics can help you write them better too. At the very least, I hope this video can get you to think critically about your favourite ship dynamics and what about them appeals to you. Prologue. What are ship dynamics? According to fan lore, ship dynamics are the stripped down versions of a fan's favourite couples to showcase the common archetypes and dynamics they enjoy in their ships. This could be the pairing of archetypes such as Grumpy and Sunshine, or the kind of dynamic that could lead to romantic or queer platonic relationships, like rivals or childhood friends. These dynamics could be present in canon or projected onto a ship for fanfiction purposes. With fandom and shipping having been around for a while, people who went through many fandoms began to realise that their favourite ships would often have similar dynamics. And this inspired artists to draw genderless and mostly featureless characters to illustrate these dynamics. The trend has exploded, spawning fanfiction discussions, AO3 tags, tier lists, skit videos, and now my video. Now there are a few fallacies I'd like to be clear about. First of all, ship dynamics are designed to be applicable to a wide variety of ships and are thus categorically broad. This means that they're often two-dimensional by nature, whereas the couples you might label with these ship dynamics are so much more complex. While I'm addressing these dynamics from a broad, non-fandom specific viewpoint, I also know that the exact approach would change once you narrow down to a specific ship. Second, these dynamics have a strong bias towards monogamous ships. That means a ship that only includes two people. And that is also what I prefer to write and read about. So that is the perspective I'm coming from. If you would like to expand on any of these dynamics or points in the video with a polyamorous perspective, I encourage you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Chapter one, Grumpy and Sunshine. Let's start with a classic, shall we? This is one of those opposites attract situations. You have the grumpy, who is known for their pessimism or short temper, and then you have the sunshine, who is the bubbly, optimistic one. People usually love this dynamic because the characters are foils for each other, and they love seeing a grumpy character have a soft spot for that one special person. Now, at this point, I would give an example of a ship I like that fits the bill, but it's really tricky because characters are rarely ever grumpy or sunshine all the time. Honestly, the only one I can think of that can really fit this dynamic without forcing it is the iconic bromance between Zuko and Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender. That's why I feel like it's very easy for this dynamic to become one note. They're just the grumpy and the sunshine. 
if that's all they are, then that gets boring real fast. In my opinion, the Grumpy Sunshine dynamic works best when it's sort of not as the entire personalities, but a starting point. Here are some examples of what I mean. If it's an established relationship, or even a friendship, outsiders might think of them as just grumpy and sunshine, but the more they see of them and their relationship, the more they see that isn't quite true. This can be especially fun to do if you have a ship that tends to get woobified by your fandom. You can use Grumpy Sunshine as a starting point for fleshing out characters as well, especially if canon doesn't give them much development to begin with. For example, if one character is just characterized as the grumpy one, you can explain why they always seem that way on screen, what informs their attitudes, in what situations might they not seem so grumpy? With Sunshine, think about why they can handle difficult circumstances with a smile on their face, and then think about what might royally piss them off. It's also good to focus on how a grumpy attitude and a Sunshine one might approach the same problem differently. In the case of a mutual acquaintance who keeps saying undermining things, Grumpy might be snappish and rude, while Sunshine might be a little too concerned with keeping the peace. Think about what kind of conflict could arise in this way, and how Grumpy and Sunshine might be able to learn from each other. However, if you just really, really want to enjoy the Grumpy-Sunshine dynamic in its purest form, but you still want the characters involved to feel in character, then instead of projecting Grumpy-Sunshine personalities over the characters, I recommend focusing on situations that bring out the Grumpy-Sunshine dynamic. For example, a fluffy one-shot where going to the art gallery brings out one character's sunshine, but another's grumpy. Maybe grumpy finds galleries to be boring and elitist. The sunshine in that situation says that grumpy doesn't have to come, but grumpy insists on doing it anyway because they know it's important to their partner, and they just want to see that smile on their sunshine's face. So, in short, I think Grumpy Sunshine is at its best when it's just an ingredient, rather than the whole meal. Chapter 2. Idiots in Love This is when two or more characters are hopelessly in love with each other, but they either can't recognize their own feelings or can't tell that the other feels the same way, even though it's plenty obvious to literally everyone else. Adrianette from Miraculous Ladybug is a perfect example. Some people love it, and some people hate it. Me? I adore it, because it can be so relatable. How many of us have had a crush on someone that failed to see that they obviously liked us too? How many of us have taken forever to puzzle out our own feelings for someone else? Another draw of this dynamic is that it's basically the combination of two incredibly popular tropes, mutual pining and slow burn. At the same time though, I get how this dynamic might frustrate a lot of people. In order to function, it has to thrive on a lack of emotional intelligence and observational skills. And it can very easily draw the unresolved romantic tension out too long. The longer the story goes on for, the harder it is to keep the couples from getting together. I think the key to a good Idiots in Love fic is that they can't just be idiots for the sake of being idiots. Like, you need to understand why they're missing each other's signals. Why might one person's I want to kiss you with tongue gesture be read as you're like a sibling to me by the other? Something else that I think helps this ship dynamic work is dual perspective, because you can showcase both the intentions each character has behind the moves they make and the conclusions they draw from the signals they receive. Idiots to Lovers is so much more enjoyable when you understand both sides of the interaction. This creates dramatic irony because it makes the mutual affections explicit to the reader while not so explicit to the characters. 
When you try to write idiots to lovers in a single perspective, it can be easy for the reader to wonder why the POV is wasting their time pursuing someone who doesn't seem interested. The goal is to make the reader shake their screen and be like, I know why you're both idiots, but why are you both such idiots? In short, if you understand why your characters are being idiots and draw the pining out for just long enough, then you've got a recipe for some delicious idiots in love. Chapter 3, Rivals. Oh, this one can be so fun. The banter opportunities are endless. Rivals, in the context of ship dynamics, are when two or more people are competing against each other. Their relationship usually starts off as mutually antagonistic, with lots of teasing and banter, but as they get to know each other more, they realize that the other isn't so bad, and thus slowly fall in love while engaging in lots of teasing and banter. You can often think of it as a milder version of enemies to lovers. Clants from Voltron is a really popular fanon ship that fits this dynamic. I'm sorry to slingshot you guys back in time. This is one of those ship dynamics that works brilliantly for slow burns, because the progression from two people hating or disliking each other to falling in love is a long one. You can first develop the slow burn friendship and then the slow burn romance. Of course, you can speed up the development if you so want. One of the biggest advantages of this trope is that if two people are competing, then they already have something in common that they can bond over. They're also already in proximity to each other, so there's no need to find contrived reasons to put them in the same room. When it comes to my thoughts on how to write this dynamic well, I think it comes down to two things. First of all, explain why they're rivals. It's more compelling if there's a deeper reason than they're both trying to be the best at what they do. Maybe one of them is an only child who has crushing expectations put on them by their parents, while the other is the youngest of five and always having to fight to be noticed. This conflict of interest is a great way to add some extra tension to your story. Secondly, and this may change depending on the ship, but avoid bad sportsmanship. In fact, an act of good sportsmanship can be a great turning point. One of the best moments between rivals is when one of them gets hit with some unfair disadvantage. Like, perhaps character A got some kind of injury that they're hiding from everyone, but they still choose to run a race against their rival, character B. Just as A is about to win, their injury flares up and they collapse. B was at a close second and they could easily steal the race, but instead they help A up and then B helps A get over the finish line first. Why? Because if not for the injury, A would have won anyway, and B only wants to win against A if it's fair and square. There's a reason why this ship dynamic is so popular. There's a lot you can do with it, and there's plenty of room for character and relationship development. As long as you're writing a dynamic narrative, you're doing great. Chapter 4, Childhood Friends. Another excellent classic right here. The childhood friends dynamic is when two or more people who were friends since they were little begin to form romantic or perhaps queer platonic feelings for each other, often in their late teens or adulthood. Sometimes one may have had feelings for the other for years, while the other took a while to either fall or figure it out. I actually did write this one a lot during my Renora phase around four or five years ago. When it comes to this dynamic, as much as I love it, it can get very frustrating if it drags on too long. That's why, in my controversial opinion, it isn't the best option for slow burn. This is because the friendship is already strongly established at the beginning of the story, so there isn't as much room for growth and development, nor many obstacles to overcome other than, what if by confessing my feelings, I ruin our friendship? That's why I'd be more likely to write this dynamic as a one-shot or perhaps a 25k word multi-chapter. 
If you want to write this trope for a longer work though, I'd recommend writing from the POV of a single character. It could be the one who's pining, or the one who hasn't realised their feelings yet. The advantage of a limited POV here is that it allows the other person's feelings to be more ambiguous, and that can reduce any ugh, just get together already feelings that the reader might have. However, if you're combining childhood friends with the idiots in love dynamic, or you're a sucker for mutual pining, then dual POV may be the better option for you. You could also write a story that does cover the whole friendship and has a lot of time skips. I'd also emphasize the history these characters share. What are their in jokes? What do they remember about each other? How do they accommodate each other's weird habits? Stuff like that. Next, if you want to provide more obstacles for a slow burn take on this trope, consider combining it with Forbidden Love. Maybe A's parents tolerated their child's friendship with B with the hope that life would just one day pull them in different directions, or you know, they just grow out of it. When B starts showing feelings for A, A's parents find that unacceptable and look for some way to break up their friendship for good. Some other things that can make friends to lovers enjoyable include friends and family teasing them. This can be a fine balance to strike since some people really don't like when stories push the idea that all close friendships, especially between men and women, inevitably lead to romance. If the couple-to-be is being teased, it should be because the ones doing the teasing see genuine chemistry between them. Childhood friends is also an excellent combination with fake dating, because if I was in a situation where I had to pretend to date someone, I probably would ask a close friend who I've known for a long time. It also gives a really good reason as to why the POV character is unsure about how their best friend feels about them. Are they actually flirting, or are they keeping up the act? Ultimately, I think childhood friends is a difficult dynamic to do poorly, since no matter how you write it, someone out there is bound to love it. As long as the reader understands why the characters are friends and why they're falling into a different kind of love, you're golden. Chapter 5. Hero and Villain Oh, this is an interesting one. Very popular and very controversial. The hero-villain ship dynamic is exactly how it sounds. The hero and the villain of the source material fall in love. I prefer it in the context of AUs, but I know it's also popular in canon divergent stories. An example of this that I ship is Zelda and Ganondorf from The Legend of Zelda series. The fanfiction about them is just that good. The reason why this ship dynamic is so appealing is because it can subvert the black and white morality of the source material by bringing out a darker side in the hero and a lighter side in the villain. Hollywood also has a tendency to write villains who want to write a systemic injustice, and heroes who fight to restore the status quo. Thus, fanfiction where the hero sees that the villain was right all along is inevitable. And of course, some people find the fantasy of a person changing themselves to be better for you really appealing, or sometimes they just like a story where people are able to unapologetically delve into their darkest impulses. Giving advice about how to write this ship dynamic is tricky, because some things that might put me off are exactly what another wants to read. For example, if the villain has killed one of the hero's loved ones, or tortured the hero, or tried to destroy the world, then I'd be rooting against a romance between them, unless it was an AU where nothing that bad ever happened. Other people, however, want to see a mass murderer and a hero fall in love. To each their own. The other thing about the hero-villain ship dynamic is that it doesn't always have to be romantic. If you like it to be romantic, good for you, but if you love to explore abusive relationships, tragedy, or the nature of toxic love, then this is an 
excellent dynamic for it. My current fic includes a lover's to enemies subplot, and let me just say, a slow burn divorce can be so much fun to write. If you do want to write a romance arc though, I recommend keeping the following in mind. First of all, understand what the hero is willing to forgive and why. If a hero known for their selflessness and empathy finds it possible to overlook the villain's greed and penchant for harming innocents, then the hero is going to feel out of character. Second, have other people be pissed that the hero is falling for the villain and have them be right. Let's say the villain once tortured the sidekick. That sidekick would have every right to feel betrayed and angry if the hero ended up dating the villain. This is the type of thing that can, should, and will end friendships. Next, build the chemistry organically. A villain and hero pairing can be a hard sell, so you cannot afford to have chemistry be assumed like you would with childhood friends. You must build it from the ground up, otherwise you're just pushing the hero and villain through a romance plot while your readers are left wondering why two people who hate each other are going for the smooch. Finally, and most important, lean into the tension and internal conflict of falling for someone you hate or should hate. This is one of the most delectable parts of hero-villain romances, when the heart betrays the mind. Let the hero and villain wrestle with what these feelings reveal about themselves. It's often something they refuse to acknowledge. When it comes to shipping villains and heroes, it is a minefield of personal preferences and icks. Keep in mind that you're never going to please everyone, even the people on board your ship, as long as you're writing with self-awareness of the problematic aspects of your ship and pay special attention to characterization, chemistry, and internal conflict, you're on the right track. Chapter 6 power couples. I saved my personal favourite for last. In my opinion, you do not get a better ship dynamic than a power couple. This is when the people involved are a great team that always have each other's back. It's mostly thought of as a couple who can fight together on the battlefield, like say Lady Noir or my OTP Midlink, but they could even be running a cafe together. As long as they're at their best when they work together, they're a power couple. The appeal of this ship dynamic is having someone you can trust completely and be your best self around. The characters involved usually know each other really well, having excellent communication skills and an equal power balance. That's why the biggest pitfall of this couple is that they can become too good together. So much so that any obstacle they confront is barely a challenge, which causes the tension to dive to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. If you want to write a power couple, give them challenges that would be impossible to face on their own, but they can barely overcome together. A great source of conflict in this ship is codependency. What happens when one doesn't have the other to watch their back? Apart, one of them could be vulnerable to being captured by the villain and the other going to save them on their own might as well be a suicide mission. How can this high tension conflict be resolved? Finally, the thing about this ship dynamic is that while it works great for an established relationship, if you want to write a longer romance arc, you can't always start off with them being an amazing team. The arc of two people learning to work together as they get to know each other can be incredible incredibly satisfying. Their chemistry grows with every challenge they face. That means that if your goal is to develop a power couple, it's really easy to keep your romance and external plots intertwined. To write the best power couples, either build their dynamic from the ground up or expand on canon, then ensure that the challenges they face can match their combined force. So there we go! 
Six popular ship dynamics and how to write them. A reminder that every ship and story is different and everyone's preferences are different. So it's possible that not all these tips will vibe with your vision. As long as you understand the appeal of your favorite ship dynamics and can incorporate them in a way that feels authentic to your stories and characters, you're doing amazing. There are dozens of ship dynamics that I couldn't cover in this video, so if there's any that you think I missed, comment below and I might just include them in a part two. And that's the end of the video! Kudos for watching, kudos for liking, and extra kudos if you've subscribed and hit the bell for more dreamy fanfiction tips. I will see you in my next video, but in the meantime, happy fic writing!